Welcome, everyone, to the Paths to Understanding podcast, uh, Wisdom from Our Neighborhood. Um, today, we're going to be sharing wisdom in our neighborhood with Michael Ramos, uh, the director, executive director of the Church Council of Greater Seattle. Before we begin, uh, we want to acknowledge that all of us are currently standing on the traditional land of the Coast Salish peoples, and we honor with gratitude the land itself and the Coast Salish peoples we share this land with. And Michael, where, whose land are you on right now? We're on uh, Duwamish land and continue to support them in their seeking respect, rights, recognition, and dignity for all their members and all their relations. Yeah, and I'm on I'm on uh, uh, Swinomish land, but also um, uh, Samish land, and uh, was actually blessed to be a, a pastor to one of the the Samish uh, Indian Nation elders, who was instrumental in helping them get uh, authorized and kind of recognized by the federal government. Um, so I'm so glad that that uh, that that I could know her. Um, so I just want to let everybody know who, who we're, we're with today. Michael Ramos came to the Northwest about 37 years ago as a Jesuit volunteer to work with people on the streets at a day drop-in center in Tacoma. He proceeded to work with housed and unhoused Central American refugees in Seattle. He's continued bringing a faith lens to work alongside people and communities experiencing marginalization for most of the last three decades. This includes six years of ministry with the Latinx community in Oakland, where he was involved in the formation stage of what is today called the Interfaith Movement for Human Integrity. He currently serves as the Executive Director of the Church Council of Greater Seattle, a position he had held since 2008. He has held in, since 2008. In this capacity, he has been engaged in direct service, education, advocacy, organizing efforts for living wages, with people experiencing homelessness and alongside recent immigrants. Through the church council, he's been an active advocate for equitable resourcing across the continuum of care throughout the geography of King County. The church council has worked with community-based partners to support local leaders to organize at intersection of homelessness and the critical lack of low income housing. He serves on the King County Pandemic Advisory Group the steering committee of the Washington Immigrant Solidarity Network and was board president of Puget Sound SAGE. He has just committed, completed his Doctor of Ministry degree program at Seattle University. He's married to Donna with two adult daughters. Michael, I'm so happy to have you join us today. Thank you for being here. Thank you very much. It's great to be with you, Terry. <clears throat> Thank you, Michael. So the Church Council of Greater Seattle is celebrating it's 100th year, you know, this last year or so. How did the Church Council of Greater Seattle get started and what's some of its history? The Church Council has a rich history uh, in the Puget Sound region. We started 100 years ago, 1919, after World War I, where faith communities of different Christian stripes sought ways to come together, realizing that uh, we can no longer rest in division around theology, but to see how we could cooperate and work together. So a number of ministers said, let's get a meeting together. And the first meeting, one person showed up. So then they said, we better organize. And uh, so two months later, 62 congregations came together at Plymouth Congregational Church in downtown Seattle, and the church council was born. And we've continued ecumenical ministry, working across uh, different denominational lines and ways of cooperation, uh, community building, education, and service and justice uh, ever since. Thank you very much. So that's that's a long time. It's amazing uh, that that organization has stayed viable and active and connected all these years. And, and I'm sure it's taken a, a great number of different um, uh, expressions throughout the year. Um, how many congregations or community groups or, or people participate in the church council's work today? Well, our formal membership structure has 16 Christian denominations and 320 congregations, but that only tells a part of the story. We work more intensively with a smaller number of those congregations and uh, with other faiths, Jewish, Muslim, Unitarian, Sikh, around issues that are dear to us, immigration, 
housing, homelessness, countering racism, ways that we can come together, uh, dialogue, trainings, workshops, which we've done for many years. And so our practice is really multi-faith um, and inclusive. That's great, thank you. And then, so as, as, uh, as your, your work with your partners you know, is, is happening, how, what kind of process do you all use to discern what kind of issues to focus on? Well, we've learned over the years that Church Council has a real rich history of working for social justice. We worked alongside of Japanese Americans after they were interned during World War II and accompanied them in their return and during the years of trauma and tragedy uh, during that time of internment. We helped to end redlining in the city of Seattle by which African-Americans were denied loans and opportunities to uh, build on, develop, uh, live in properties um, in certain areas of the city um, and then were excluded from other areas of the city. And we helped to uh, create laws uh, that outlawed these practices. So social justice is part of our DNA. In other words, a faith that does justice. That being said, we have learned over the years of there are two types of change. One that is uh, a quick change that may end up in a practice or policy and then long-term change. And the short-term change through advocacy, unfortunately at times can be overturned by a change of administration, a quirk in the law or some kind of other challenge. And we realize that sustainable change is relationship driven. It has to do with people and people's lives and everybody is a leader. Everybody has capacity to act for change. And so we wanna tap into that basic capacity and dignity that everybody has uh, through community organizing to sit, build long-term sustainable change and what we might call collective power, the power that's God given to act on our own behalf and those of our neighbors and loved ones around us. Yeah, so I really appreciate that because in the last you know 10 years or so, I've, I've learned a lot more about community organizing, Michael, and and, and as such began to kind of, you know, take more of a critical look at my own leadership through the years. I've been an ordained pastor for 30 years in the Lutheran church, you know, and, and I think uh, quite a few times in the past, you know, I've sat around with really good hearted people who weren't personally experiencing a problem and decided around some conference table what to do about it without necessarily having conversation with and centering on um, the people who are most impacted by the problem and community organizing, you know, really values that. So that, that sort of listening to the people most impacted by a, a problem and then, and then helping them or letting them lead us all towards some kind of solution. So we're, we're, we're building power together. Um, exactly. So, you know, so, so how did the, how did that conversation that move toward community organizing happen? What were the kind of the moments that led you all in that direction? Well, it's still underway. I think that there's a, there is a, a belief that the spirit is moving with the church council, with people of faith in our wider communities who where, as you mentioned, impacted communities are demanding change. And we try to harness that energy and create some methodologies such as listen, learn, act, reflect, listen, learn, act, reflect, a way where it's kind of a pastoral circle of action and reflection or praxis to use a theological term, where people are engaged with reflecting on their lives, seeing what needs to be different and realizing there are paths to help create the change they wanna see. I realized after years of working in advocacy, the church council, we had worked in direct services for many years around transitional housing, a furniture bank, elder care and companionship, youth employment. We had done many services and ministries over the years. We moved to one that was relationship-based with congregations. And we realized that advocacy 
as a seasonal enterprise. In other words, um, was important work in terms of changing laws and policies, but it didn't necessarily engage the members at a deeper level, A, with each other, and B, with their local areas, uh, and in terms of what they could really impact with their lives. And so I realized that advocacy is important and many organizations do a great job of that. We wanna honor that. And now we realize that advocacy for us is the fruit of organizing where we say not only that we want to see a certain change, but we have a base of support that will guarantee that that change will last if it's enacted into law. And so those policies, whether it's protecting tenants where they live, the ability to build housing in certain areas, the ability to provide for homeless services uh, without regard to who, you know, who is considered, uh, you know, homeless or who is considered uh, to be able to be housed um, while homeless. Um, those things we've been able to sort of uh, create together. And what it does is it, it guarantees that we're focused on the people who are coming together and they themselves are changing in the process. It's not a matter of being an expert or knowledgeable about all things in the law, but it's realizing our own capacity within us and having the audacity to act not alone, but together. So it's not a matter for expertise or, or people with a lot of knowledge, but it's for all of us and it's accessible to us and it's an expression of our faith because fundamentally we're community driven. We're community led, we are a community. And so community organizing leads us to foster greater uh, elements of community. Um, and so I realized that advocacy uh, is important, but especially as a growth of organizing that builds what Dr. King calls the beloved community, a beloved community that counters the triplets of evil that he pointed out, racism, militarism, and poverty. As a counterweight to that, what do we create? Generate beloved community. It has, community organizing has to do with community. That makes the work more joyful. It makes it more inclusive. It makes it more faithful and it makes it more lasting in terms of outcomes and change. I want to uh, let everybody know that that Michael's uh, also caring for a couple of dogs here who who, who apparently sometimes are making some little noises. So if you're hearing something in the background, it's just his puppies being puppies. Um, so Michael, part of what I have been thinking about with community organizing and have reflected on a lot is is that there's three ways to understand power, you know, to kind of express power. One is power over other people. One is power for other people, and one is power with other people. And of course, power over, I think most of our you know, religious traditions you know, tell us is not what the divine intends. Power for is okay occasionally, but you know, if it's not carefully stepped out of to move into power with, it can very easily you know, sustain the kind of power differentials and injustices that they were seeking to to deal with in the first place. And that really community organizing is about creating power with others and creating, as you say, a big enough base that, that um, our elected leaders um, have no choice, you know, really, but to, to um, create that, the, the changes in policies and laws, but also practices uh, so that we as a community can live, you know, together in a more just society. So, I, I just really appreciate what community organizing brings. It is, it is a, a, a longer process. It's not as quick uh, sometimes, but I think it's more lasting than many other ways of, of, of operating and in, in working for justice. Well, I think in the, <clears throat> from a Christian spiritual perspective, there are two elements that uh, go along with what you're saying, and that is a spirit of walking alongside others, uh, particularly people on the margins of society, uh, and helping them to come to the center. 
In other words, we come alongside and we use the word accompaniment for that, to walk alongside another, uh, not to walk in front of, uh, not to walk for another, but to walk with. And the other is the reality that the church has much to do to confront racism within our communities. And racism divides, racism excludes, racism denies the God-given humanity and equality that we enjoy uh, as created in the image of God. And so we have a responsibility to both confront racism in a way that walks alongside other people. And that in doing so, in confronting what Jim Wallace, the evangelical preacher calls America's original sin, we are at one and the same time building community and doing it in such a way uh, that all God's people can join together uh, and find a way to work together for common cause. Um, and that is uh, for the good of all the people in a particular area, in a particular zone, um, without reference to one religion or another necessarily. And so, um, so we aim uh, to respond at, in a systems way um, with those concepts in mind. Yeah, so it's, it's really not only are you working for the goal of ending racism, you're trying to work in a way where racism is ending through the way you're doing the work. That's yes, really what I'm we, hearing you say. Yes, as an organization, we try to bring an anti-racist lens to our work, which says, how do we act in ways that counter patriarchy, that counter colonialism? In other words, uh, sometimes the way money, resources, land are used exclude, or they are taken away, or power is removed from people to be able to have jurisdiction or autonomy over these resources. So how do we create a space where all can enjoy uh, God's creation, all can enjoy God's abundance, all can participate in a shared decision-making model where everyone has a voice and a vote and everyone can enjoy the, the fruits at the banquet table, which are meant for all. Well, and in the end, Michael, I mean, that, that sort of society actually benefits everyone. I mean, there have been so many studies and, and thoughtful um, analyses that show that, that racism actually impacts everybody negatively, just not, not as, as the same way or with the same percentage of impact, perhaps. But, but when, uh, for instance, uh, a, a, an African-American family is able to run a business um, they end up buying things from other businesses around them, mm -hmm. you know, uh, in such a way, it would, if, if an immigrant comes in, uh, many studies economically have shown that within a very short period of time, those, those immigrant families are actually contributing to the well-being and the economic even well-being of their entire community, mm -hmm. because they're buying goods and services as well, that other people are, are selling and, and providing. So, we, we often have this, this notion of the economy as a zero sum game. There's a, the pie is so big and if somebody else gets a little bit more, we won't get what we need. And that's not really the way it works uh, most of the time. That's right. And you know, look at, uh, for example, immigrants. Immigrants are net contributors to our economy. Um, and then underlying that is the fact when all have a chance to participate in producing, participating in, consuming within uh, an economy that's equitable, everyone benefits. It, we're, we're a better society. If some are excluded, it limits, it limits the possibilities uh, for, reaching, for reaching new people, uh, for the interchange that occurs. And it takes away from the creativity of uh, immigrants and others who are, are generating new ideas, businesses, possibilities, services within the community. Uh, yes, we're all liberated uh, when everyone is uh, liberated. Uh, so everyone has, we have a, therefore a stake in each other. Um, and that's also one of the uh, understandings around organizing is that we all have, we all have a place in this and we all, um, we all win when each of us 
is able to benefit and participate fully. So I, I know, Michael, that you're a, a Roman Catholic and, um, you know, you, you got your start in Seattle, you know, um, you know, working um, within the Jesuit, you know, community. Um, what, what is it about this work with the council that's important to you? Like, like what, what kind of deep motivation uh, or part of your own story really gets you excited to do this work? Well, it, it, it goes back even further. The fact I'm of Puerto Rican and Spanish background from New York City. My family was lower middle class. There was a time where um, my father was without a job and we had to go to the church to see if we could get help with the rent. And the Monsignor at the time said, I've got the answer. The St. Vincent de Paul Society can help. And so St. Vincent de Paul, which exists all throughout the Northwest, uh, helping people with rental assistance, well, they helped my family in downtown Manhattan uh, many years ago, and I've never forgotten that. And the fact that my mother's been able to live in a rent-stabilized apartment for these 50 years, still to this day, thanks be to God, um, is uh, by uh, the chance to live, uh, to live uh, in a place where the rents are not exorbitant, even in New York City, um, possible. And so it goes back to the roots of that the people who are migrating, people who are without homes or homeless, people who are seeking to live in affordable housing or to get food on the table. Well, these are my people. Uh, my, I see my story in their story. And so uh, they're the people who are brothers and sisters and siblings with whom I'm to be in community with. So they're not an other. And this goes to people of various religious traditions as well. I learned very early as a Catholic in college that from Paul Tillich that if you want to get to know other religions, go to the heart of your own religion. And there I found concepts that in my own tradition are shared in the different religious traditions, the dignity of the human person, the commitment to justice, the commitment to equality, the honoring God through love of neighbor. These are concepts that uh, transfer in other religious traditions. So I see my work as an expression of my own spirituality. And in the Christian tradition, the love of neighbor without exclusion, this sense of uh, working uh, to help liberate the captives and free the oppressed, is part and parcel of living a faith that does justice, as the Jesuit, uh, Jesuits like to say, um, and practicing a love without exclusions, uh, where all can enjoy at the banquet table. It's just part of who I am. You know, I, I, I too, I mean, I, I, I have a different story, but you know, my, my, uh, my mom was diagnosed with MS when I was a little kid. And I watched people move away from our family and kind of diminish them. Uh, my family experienced the loss of a business and a bankruptcy. And, uh, and I saw people again diminish my family because of that. And, uh, and kids bullied me at school because of that in part. And so, you know, when I saw American Muslims getting bullied, uh, something just really deep in me needed to respond. And of course, you know, as with all these things, uh, there's a deep motivation from our own story for it. But then over time, you get to know people and you begin to love them and you realize I can't be fully human without people that are different from me, <laughs> right? Without people that, that, um, that I also share so much uh, in common with in terms of values. And so I really resonate with your story, Michael. Well, thank you. Yeah, I think the uh, I've grown to love the immigrant communities that I work with. Uh, the people uh, who are organizing to confront their own homelessness within our communities. Uh, I, I, I know them. I know them as people. I know them as uh, good human beings who deeply care about one another. And I just, just want to join with them uh, and struggle with them for justice. 
So you've talked a little bit about the work of the Church Council with respect to racism, and I know that that is just an absolutely you know huge topic that is really important. And we can talk more about that, but I, I also want to get to this uh, to the work uh, that that you've done on the fifteen dollar minimum wage, and and why is it that you think that 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 issue is so important right now? That the idea of a, of a of a living wage. Why is that so important, Michael? Well, the church council has a long history of working for living wages uh, to support uh, uh, working people, whether it is farm, whether it is farm workers or people in grocery stores. Uh, people should be able to support their families and have a place to live and thrive uh, with what they earn, and that's a that's a fundamental. So when uh, the concept of fifteen dollars an hour occurred, not not just in Seattle, but in SeaTac, first of all, we stood with all the airport workers who were fighting for a sense of justice as people were traveling and had the luxury of being able to fly. The people who were working at, in these settings uh, very much were struggling to make ends meet. So we stood with them. This goes back to security screeners back in the day who were making $8.50 an hour and speaking out for justice this was before 9-11. Then 9-11 occurred and they, many of them lost their jobs. So uh, the value of work and the importance that everyone plays in a society is very important, but it comes to dignity and respect. People deserve to participate fully in the economy, enjoy the ability to thrive and enjoy some leisure time with their families uh, because uh, people are people work in order to live. And living is uh, part of who we are and living in community is what makes a society thrive. And so um, the living wage movement that we sponsored back in the early 2000s and have continued uh, through the course of uh, $15 an hour in Seattle and the sense of a just economy where everyone's rights and income is respected with, with benefits um, is just part and parcel of who we are uh, because the economy is meant to serve people, not the other way around. And so uh, our commitment has been fundamental there um, and, uh, and part of the effort to transform situations of poverty to one of economic uh, equality. Yeah, I really so respect and resonate with that. I mean, I think we have a, a, a an economy that all too often right now um, places wealth over work, right? It, it values values wealth more than work, and and that really is so destructive um, of of the entire economy and, and of human beings in general. And I think another another you know kind of challenge that we sort of have in conversation around this is the way that that we talk about. Um, uh, about providing for basic needs for people who can't work, right? So on the one hand, some people will say, well, the reason people are poor is because they don't work. When in fact, many people are working two or three jobs for two or three different you know, organizations trying to manage all that. And they're still working at the poverty level. That's, that's correct. And people want to people work. They want to support their families. They want to be productive. And so it's a fallacy to say, well, you know, people just don't want to work. Um, it is that people are working very hard, uh, but the economy does not reward them, does not value what, what they are doing. And that gets into the issues of uh, the vast gulfs of inequality that exists in an economy that serves those at the upper end of society and uh, rewards them in ways that do not have to do with their product productivity, but has to do with the way an economy is tilted for those who have, and those who have not are left out. In a society that tolerates people to struggle with low income, to become homeless within our society, is not the just society that God dreams for us. And so we're about changing the narrative to one where all belong and all have an ability to uh, to support themselves and their families in, in productive work and productive contributions in society. 
Well, we've seen that there's this debate right now at, at the national level about raising the, the minimum wage, you know, which is not necessarily the same thing as a living wage, right? Uh, in different counties, there's different costs of living and that sort of thing. But we really have seen wages stagnate on a inflation adjusted level uh, since about 1975 in this country. Mm -hmm. or, you know, so wages have stagnated, but you see at the very same time, the a rise in rent and the cost of housing. And so, you know, you, you just have to understand, we have, people have to understand that once you get to a certain, uh, beyond a certain ratio of the median income and the cost of housing, you're going to see ho homeless rates rise. So and so what but what happens is people people think, well, I worked hard to have what have the home I have. And so they don't recognize that other people are working hard. It just it didn't it didn't that that hard work didn't pay off for them. That's that's absolutely correct. Um, I think that people have to understand that um, the rising rents, for example, in the Puget Sound area or in different cities. That has an effect uh, for every hundred dollars of rental increase, homelessness increases by about 15%, one study showed. And so this sense of people, people wanting to pay their rent, they want to live in dignity. Uh, they want to be able to raise their families and their children, but there are way too many households who are facing eviction, or facing trouble making the rent, and especially in the context of a pandemic, which has health risks, especially for people of color, and also an economy where people are losing their jobs. Even if you're in essential work, that work is very tenuous. Um, and so it is no guarantee that A, you're gonna be able to continue to work, and then B, you have hanging over your head the ability to pay your rent uh, from month to month. And so why not both salary and benefit people so that they can support their families. Um, and that, that way um, it lessens the need for uh, basic services uh, for, for people. But you have to have those guardrails. You have to have a safety net uh, for people because um, it takes a lot. Um, I sponsored study around the state of what was called the self-sufficiency standard in Washington state, what it takes to make ends meet uh, without public or private assistance. And the cost of living is very high in certain areas of our state um, nation, things like childcare, transportation, healthcare. These things are not givens in a society such as ours. And so we have to forge together and build movements and build community uh, so that people do not feel so alone, that they feel that they have some opportunities, they have a place to go. And so the concept of community centers or mutual aid societies, people coming together in different and creative ways uh, to help both meet needs, provide a level of community support, and to help people to orient uh, themselves to be able to say, we can make a difference together over time where we all thrive. Yeah, I, I was reading a, a a really good, really great book on the economy on economics and and uh, what she what the author pointed out was that work participate work work participation rates in countries where there's a really important and and powerful safety net are about the same as in the United States of America. Mm -hmm. So as you pointed out, like people want to work, they want to contribute to the larger society. There are some folk who who may not be able to do that, uh, but uh, but but you know I think we have this like like false notion of 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 self dependence as if I grow all my own food as if I can pull my own tooth when I when I need it as if I can you know, you know do my own brain surgery <laughs> as if I can build all the roads that I have. Um, sometimes we have gone too far toward the individual, and not yes. understand that we're individuals within a community. <clears throat> And that's where people of faith come in, <clears throat> um, countering individualism, co competition, and greed with a sense of equity, a spirituality where we're all bonded together in an essential unity and justice, where all God's people deserve to be treated with dignity and respect. Uh, 
helps to, we're, that's why I say people of faith are about changing the narrative, changing the story to one that is community centered. As Dr. King said, the beloved community, how do we sow those seeds? Well, it begins locally, it continues sustainably, and it lasts for a lifetime. So what is the church council doing, for instance, on the, the homeless, on the issue of, of those that are unhomed? Like, what are some of the initiatives you're working on and what are, who are some of the partners you're working with? So um, in our community organizing work, <clears throat> we are uh, distributed geographically. We began in South King County. Why? Because it was the highest level of need uh, within our community and very few organizations, including social service agencies, placed any staff in those areas to mm -hmm. do the work. So we have our, our first organizer was there. We have more organizers there now. And so concepts that whether building, supporting a winter shelter, supporting the use of a hotel during the pandemic, uh, to house people who are homeless so they don't have to be crowded into congregate uh, spaces. Uh, the concept of uh, supporting the building of affordable housing and shelter in places like White Center, uh, and in places like Bellevue. These are, these are efforts that <clears throat> begin to uh, change structurally a situation where we say we have no shelter and people are on the streets. And to say that rather than not in my backyard, say, these are my neighbors and these are part and parcel of our community. And if we don't tackle homelessness as a region together, we all suffer in the end. And so we're part of, we're both on the structural end trying to change the story and advocate for more resources, while at the same time working at the local level to say, these are our neighbors, these are part and parcel of our community. And when uh, people who are unhoused are housed, we all benefit. And they all have a place where they can move forward in their lives. Um, and so there is no substitute for a roof over your head. And there's, and it is the first essential step uh, for people uh, recovering themselves. It, it, the funny thing is that the people who have been in uh, hotels that have been secured by King County during the pandemic, people who have been homeless, um, they have their lives have turned around by being in those spaces. And people said, well, no, they won't go into you know, the hotel or they won't benefit or, but actually, their lives have opened up and they've been able to recover uh, an important part of themselves and they've been able to see a future beyond that night or the next day and to be able to feel a little bit more secure for their own personal safety and well being. And so, homelessness is one where many of the populations, the different populations, have been affected family and children, veterans, different right. the community. And while piece by piece, we've been able to make progress in some areas, uh, we still have a ways to go. And so uh, locally rooted work combined with policy change makes a difference over time. So what role do you think um, increasing the kind of, you know, the, 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 the amount of housing, um, you know, what, what role do you think uh, <clears throat> You know, sort of, sort of a city planning or community planning is is having on this. What needs to change on that end of things? So I'm part of the King County uh, Regional Authority on Housing, and we're trying to have 44,000 units built or developed in King County alone by 2024. That is a super ambitious goal. Wow. Why? Because units are becoming unaffordable. People get displaced, become homeless, or they have to move 50 miles or 100 miles away in order to get away from loved ones, away from work, away from resources, away from the schools that, that their children know. That's really unacceptable for a society as wealthy and well off as ours. So we, you know, we have to be able to um, develop 
the ability not only city by city, but regionally. And this is a challenge to foster cooperation, to say that, well, some of my, my city is, is well off, but and your city has a higher percentage of people who are homeless, so it's your problem. You can't just say we're going to put people on a bus or or you know a train and send and send people to another city. Homelessness is an issue that affects every city. And so therefore there has to be a much greater degree of cooperation and intentionality to say this is something to be solved. Too much tacitly it's tolerated as something that comes with the economy. And that is that is the flip side of the American dream. And one that people of faith particularly have to counter. And we have to counter it at the individual level by tending to people in our congregations and in our neighborhoods who are experiencing homelessness to help us to understand what it's really like. And then we have to work for structural change to change systems that are unjust and that affect uh, some people more than others. And to be able to say that that system can change, but it requires a spirit of cooperation. It requires real intentionality in work together. And it requires this sense of this person is my brother, this person is my sister, this person is my sibling. And so if they are outside, that is something where I hurt and feel it inside. And I don't accept that to be wet, cold. We have, we have the highest number of people who've died in the streets in King County over the last year, well over a hundred people uh, outside or, or by violence uh, while experiencing homelessness. And it's just not acceptable. And so there is a sort of righteous indignation uh, in a, in as I, as a Christian, say, in the spirit of Jesus to say, we've got to turn over the tables uh, where uh, some people are not treated with dignity and respect, and some people are being uh, taken advantage of or deprived of their rights, and to say that no one is outside of God's care and concern, and therefore everyone is within the jurisdiction of our love as uh, brothers and sisters and siblings, children of God. You know, I know, I, I remember in the story about, uh, stories about Jesus, you know, that people were often upset with him because he he was hanging out with sinners and tax collectors and such. And, and of course, uh, people that were called sinners in the first century were not necessarily people who had any moral failings. Uh, it was that they were poor and were thus unable to uh, do, do some of the ritual things that were required of them and because they were having to get by they were having to try to survive and so there was a kind of it's a kind of a typical human um you know dynamic you know perhaps or tendency to blame people for the situations that they get into because the larger society is not functioning the way it, it should and That's that both right. self justifies, you know, what I have, but it also justifies my not caring about what, what happens to them, you know. And so I think one of the beauties of religious traditions, whether it's the Christian one or, or any other one, is that we have these stories that help us recognize those kinds of dynamics. Mm -hmm. And of course, as a Christian, then I have to like question myself, well, am I blaming that homeless person even in, in my, my own internal you know, conversation for for being homeless, when in fact, I've not done all that I can to help change this larger structure so that we can all live with a house. Yeah, so sometimes we forget the privilege under which many of us live and that in cooperating with systems that press down upon people, that's where, the, where oppression comes from, in pressing down upon them, we are complicit in their suffering and that's how that's how racism functions that is also how the economic system uh functions and poverty is created and poverty is perpetuated where vast inequalities lead to uh people who do not have the opportunity 
do not have the resources and are deprived of the opportunities to be able to uh, go forward and be able to sustain themselves and one another around them. So what I what I hear you saying, Michael, and this is something that I that I said with uh, with uh, you know Sister Anila out you know in all of our facts over fear and faith over fear, uh, you know uh, speaking to her around the state, is that we don't have to live like this. Mm -hmm. We do not have to live like this, and and changing this is not going to harm people. It's actually going to be better. Uh, I have a brother that works in the agricultural, you know, uh, kind of commodities business, uh, and you know what I've shared with him and others is that you all would do better if wealth and income inequality were lessened. Because what's the first thing people do when they get money after they get a home? They buy better food. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. not going to harm you, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Um, you know, so it's it's part of it is this failure of imagination. So when you think about the world as it could be, you know, we've been talking here a little bit about the world as it is, but when you think about the world as it could be, uh, you know, what 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 sort of in your mind? I mean, I heard you talk about the beloved community, but but what would that look like in your in your imagination? Well, it, it would begin by everyone being housed, uh, people having a, a place to live, uh, a place to raise their family, live with loved ones, be connected with their relations uh, in a place where they can they can have food that is good. We you know we we still have parts of cities where kind of food deserts where people yeah. can't get good and food nutritious food. We'd have schools that where uh, children can get a, a good education uh, and be treated respectfully and have a path up uh, for their lives. There'd be a greater level of economic mobility uh, within our society. And there'd be a place where this sense of uh, people of privilege uh, would recognize the fact that if we are not looking out and attending to what people who are black, indigenous, people of color are crying out and saying, um, then we're we're missing we're missing the boat in terms of uh, what a beloved community is. Because the beloved community says that black, indigenous, people of color are central to a thriving society. Their lives need to flourish. And the conditions need to be created where they can flourish uh, without discrimination, where people have a chance where uh, equality is closer to being achieved and repair is done for harm that has occurred that have denied, excluded, um, and uh, cost people both uh, the opportunity and in some cases their very lives. And so the Christian community has everything to do with fostering repair, other religious traditions say the same. The concept of tikkun olam in the Jewish tradition, repair of the world. And so how do we knit together the fabric uh, that we are one people? We are united by the fact that we're human. We're human beings, uh, equal in the eyes of God, worthy for who we are, not for what we do or consume but who we are as people. And that's at the heart of all our religious traditions. And then we practice it with a sense of compassion on the one hand, where we're, we're, we're loving of one another and solidarity that says we'll stand to create structures uh, where we can uh, live together in peace, shalom in our cities and country. Thank you so much for that. I as I go out to different churches and talk about countering anti-Muslim bigotry, most of the time I, I start off talking about what monotheism was trying to accomplish. Mm -hmm. And that was to help human beings who are captivated by in-group, out-group dynamics. Mm -hmm. To recognize that the group that's an out-group is also a part of a larger in-group called the human race. Mm -hmm. called you know so we're all created in the image of god we're all we're, we're all created by one creator the the idea behind that wasn't mono religionism that there's one religion we all got to agree but rather there's monotheism there's one creator there's one divine there's one source 
uh, to use a more secular term, of all things. And so we're all sisters and brothers, even, even in the midst of our differences. And, yeah. uh, and that's really hard for people to understand. They, they've sort of forgotten, I think, because we've retribalized uh, monotheism. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it grieves me so much. And so when I talk about it, sometimes people will just shake their head violently because they believe that because they're Christians, they are therefore mm -hmm. superior to people around them. When right. Jesus himself claimed no such superiority. <laughs> mm -hmm. yes. Drives me crazy. <laughs> yes. Well, thank you very much, Terry. I really appreciate this opportunity to be with you. <laughs> and, I, and I appreciate the, the chance to, to be with you, Michael, and get to know you a little bit better. And for people to be able to hear about the work of the church council, uh, where can they go to find out more and to begin to participate in your work? Uh, www.thechurchcouncil.org has up-to-date information, uh, our website, um, and mramos, M-R-A-M-O-S, at thechurchcouncil.org to be in touch with me. I'd love to hear from people. Thank you so much. And thank you for your for the community organizers who I would love to talk with at some point and hear their stories and their experiences and perhaps even uh, bring on some people that they're working with in the local community um, so that we can also center on the voices of those most impacted by, by issues and learn from their wisdom because they usually know exactly what needs to happen uh, to yes. change things. Yes, indeed. And, thank and you very much. Yeah, and to all of you who are listening, we really appreciate you joining us for this last hour. Um, all the Paths to Understanding podcasts can be found at pathstounderstanding.org on major podcasting services or um, our YouTube channel. Until we see you again, be well, be calm, and be good to your neighbors.